We're going to pray. We're going to commit this time to the Lord. Thank you all for coming this morning. Amen. And also for those that are watching through Zoom today. Praise God. Okay, let's stand and then let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Let's just pray. Just take a few minutes. Just pray for the meeting this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory and honor. We worship you this morning. Father, just fill this place, sanctify this place by the blood of Jesus and fill this place to this morning with the presence of God. Let the presence of God fill your temple, God, in the name of Jesus. Father, I just pray this morning that you open our heart to receive a fresh vision for ICC in each and every one of us, oh God. Father, I just pray you stretch your hand this morning and touch us, revive us, renew us, refresh us, and strengthen us, oh God. And Father, right now, we want to thank you for all that you are doing and the things that you're about to do in this church. And Father, we want to commit once again our lives to you. We pray, Father, for your glory, for your kingdom, that you use us mightily. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone say, Amen and Amen. amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Amen. Praise God. Um, I don't have any notes for you this morning uh, because, um, first of all, the first part of the seminar, I'll be preaching. So it's more like to encourage you, to build you up, and to give you some information, more information about discipleship. Now, I believe most of you have gone to your live group, and you probably have gone through some of the lessons on discipleship, about the calling, about the, of course, from Matthew 28, um, the verse that we always read, and we're going to read it once again this morning to remind us why we are here this morning. All right. Albert, if you can put on the verse, Matthew 28, verse 18. All right. Somebody want to read this? Anybody here have your Bible or you want to? Okay, Sarah, go ahead, read it. Matthew 28, verse 18. It's right here, okay, on the screen, yeah. yeah. When Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Again, and, and this is nothing new to us, especially those of us that are here this morning and those of you watching through Zoom. Um, this is part of ICC. This is who we are. This is our DNA that we are called to go and make disciples. All right. And we are strong this year in emphasizing, in promoting, and we want the people in this church to receive this vision and go and make disciples. Now, actually, to be honest with you, this command is not just given to ICC. It's given to the church as a whole. That means it doesn't matter whether you are in ICC or not, we are all called to go and make disciples. But as far as here is concerned, we're going to try our very best and we're going to promote, we're going to challenge the people to go and make disciples. We're going to provide a platform and we're going to um, help them to go and make disciples. Now, whether one day you remain in ICC or you go to another church or go to the mission field like Deepak and Alicia, you will always carry with you this burden, this compassion, uh, this desire and calling to make disciples. All right? And that's what we want to do. In fact, everything about ICC, if you, if you look into it very carefully, even in tithes and offering and everything else, what we want is that we do not want... We do not want people to do anything religiously, but rather we want to teach the people from, to do something that is scriptural from their heart. That means if it's burned in your heart, if it's something come from your heart and you believe in it, no matter where you go, you will continue to practice what God has called us to do, all right? It's not just because you are in ICC. It's like Mission Faith Pledge. Some people say, I'm in ICC, I'm giving, but once I leave the church, I'm not going to give. Then you miss the point. 
All right? That's not what we're doing here. I, I, my kids, for example, Sean, uh, you know, for years when they are young, we always tell them, Mission Pledge is part of, part of, part of our DNA, part of who we are. And, and they do it from young. And then when Sean came to college here, he went to his pastor and said, do you have Mission Pledge here? <laughs> he said, no. Okay, it's okay. I'll still give it. <laughs> Every month I'm going to give my Mission Pledge, whether you have it or not. But I'm going to give it because this is what I believe. You know? And that's what it's all about. And we want to make sure discipleship is part of who we are. It's not a program, it's not something extra, and it's not an option, all right? It is something that God has put in our spirit when we are born again. When we receive Jesus Christ, that calling is in us. And if we don't do it, there is something missing in us in our Christian world. We can grow in our prayer life, we can grow in our attendance, we can grow in our service, but we can never fully reach our potential until we actually make disciples because this is who God has called us to be. All right? So that is why it's so important for us to go. And I like the word go here because it, it tells me that you have to go and find it. You got to go and search for it. You got to go out there. You can't be waiting. It, said, it, it didn't say wait there for and make disciples. It said go and make disciples. That means you got to go and get people saved. You got to go and find and make disciples. You got to go. To your neighbors, you got to go to your friends, your family members, even in the church. Go and make disciples. That means you got to get out. You got to get up. You got to get out. You got to move forward and make disciples. Amen. Let me tell you, years of discipling people in the church, most, almost all of my disciples is because I went to them and said, hey, will you pray about this? C can I disciple you? And a, lo a lot of, of course, a lot of them say, yes, I would love that. But some of them will say, no, that's fine. But I still try. I still go forward. Some of them say, no, no, thank you. And I say, God bless you too. Amen. <laughs> the question this morning is this. And that's what the whole seminar is all about. The question is, are we making disciples? All right? We can talk about it. We can understand it with our mind. We can receive it in our spirit. But unless we go, unless we actually making disciples. Now, by the way, you are not a disciple until you're actually making disciples, all right? Now, but first of all, you have to be a disciple of Christ by being born again. You become the disciple of Christ because you obey His commandment, all right? And we're going to talk a little bit more about it, all right? You become a disciple, but to go and make disciple is a different thing. And if you are truly a disciple of Christ, you will make disciples. It's an automatic thing in your heart, in your life. It, and, and of course, in the definition that we are talking about in this church, when you go and make disciples, we always think about the books, the discipleship book that we have. We always think about, oh, yeah, I taught this book. I've gone through this book. But let me tell you, in the New Testament, there's no such thing as a book. <laughs> Making disciple, and we're going to talk a lot more later, it's about mentorship. It's about what Paul said, follow me as I Follow Christ. And that is what it's all about. The word disciple that we, we just read, go and make disciple. The word disciple means, from Vine Dictionary, means one who follows another's teaching. All right? That's why in verse 20, it says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. All right? So it comes back to about teaching. And the best teaching is not books. To be honest with you, it's your lifestyle. It's your demonstration of your lifestyle to another person that they may see and follow you. Things that you will remember the most is because you saw someone doing it. I mean, look, there are habits in my life that I'm doing. And many times we don't know about, we don't even realize about it. It's because things that we saw our parents did it. And it become part of us and then now we're doing it. All right? And we're like, wow, where did I learn that? Oh, it's my dad. Okay, that's what's wrong of him. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but what I mean is that those act, those lifestyle, those things that we saw when we were childhood, it, it changed our life. All right? So that is why it's so important for us to be teaching through our lifestyle. That's why we talk about mentorship. All right? So a disciple is someone that is learning 
and teaching at the same time, all right? You learn from your masters. You learn from your teachers. You learn from the person that is teaching you the word of the Lord. And now you are bringing the same thing and you are teaching something. Learning and teaching. Be teachable. Having a humility, a humble heart to receive from someone the things of the Lord, all right? Now, of course... In every one of us, when we are teaching, when we are mentoring, when we are uh, imparting something to someone, there are a lot of stuff that is not scriptural. All right, there's a lot of things that someone maybe you're following that you see, well, that's not like Christ. That's okay. That's what the sanctification is all about. We are growing, we are changing from glory to glory. But Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So, Fix your eyes on Christ. So as you are being mentored by someone, look at the person. What is in Christ Jesus that the person is doing that I can learn and adapt and, and receive? That's what we call. Don't say, I don't want to follow that person because I'm better than the person. Or I don't want to follow the person because I see so many Christless things. No, no, no. But there is Christ thing in the person. All right? And that's what we are called to do. The goal is this, the discipleship, the goal. We're teaching, we are going to make disciples. The goal is, the final goal is this, is to be more like Jesus. That's right. That means we are not teaching anything else except Him. All right? So the, the final goal is that what we are teaching, what we are imparting, what we are receiving as a disciple or a discipler, is this, is that we may be changed and transformed to be more like Jesus. It's not about head knowledge. It's not about copying something. It's about transformation that we may become more like Jesus. So the question is, the success of discipleship is, is the person being changed and transformed to be more like Jesus? I've, I look at my disciple and I always ask this question, did I... During my time with the person, discipling the person, have I seen or have I seen transformation to be more like Christ in that person? If not, that something is wrong with my teaching. That means sometimes it may be I'm just finishing the book. I'm just going through the book. I don't really care after that. Or sometimes it can be there are things in the life of the person that I need to confront or talk to. And we're going to talk about that in a little while about mentorship. And, and I'm not, so I'm not going to go into it. All right. But the goal is to be more like Jesus. All right. In the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 40, say, A discipler is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be what? Like his teacher. Amen. Follow me as I follow Christ. So at the end of the day, it's all about Christ. All right? And what we want to see is when people in the world see you, they see Christ. All right? All right? I, and I know sometimes when you are being mentored or this, by someone, you tend to want to follow something about that person that is not of Christ. So we need to be careful to always promoting Christ. Amen? I remember in Japan, there's a guy that I was mentoring, and everywhere I go, he will follow me. All right? And, um, and in those days, I loved to, to chew on Mentos. You know what Mentos is, correct? <laughs> yes, uh, the fresh mint, you know. Um, and after a few months, this guy bought Mentos too. I like, do you like Mentos? I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning to like Mentos. I like, you don't have to. But pastor, if you like it, that means something is good about this thing. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you can, you can copy me. No, but, uh, you know, sometimes we tend to do that. I mean, look at movie stars and singers that we admire so much. We, we tend to copy the way they dress, the way they talk, the way they do, you know. And that's part of it. But the most important of us, we as disciples, we want to make sure we bring Jesus. All right? All right, we don't want them to copy about us. Our, we don't want to duplicate Daniel Ong, basically. We want to duplicate Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, so what is the mark of discipleship? What is the thing that makes you a disciple of Christ? The first thing is this. Now, we're talking about Jesus Christ, all right? We're talking about follow me as I follow Christ. So the thing is, what makes you different and what makes you a disciple of Jesus Christ is this, that you abide in Jesus and His Word. All right, okay, in, in John chapter 8, 
verse 31 say this, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believe him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. All right, Abide in Christ and his word, in his teaching, in his ways. His ways are perfect. All right, so if you want to promote Jesus, if you want to impart Jesus, you yourself has to abide in Christ. There's no way around. That means you ha- Jesus has to increase and you have to decrease. That means everything about you, your like, your dislike has to decrease and everything about Jesus and his ways and his like have to increase in your life. That means their habits, their ways of life, their lifestyle, their things that you may like, that's it's not God. You start rejecting those. You start, it's year by year, you start seeing yourself, those things are not important anymore. Yeah. Those things, I'm no interest anymore. And you don't even know why, but it's all because your heart has been changed. Now your heart is sold out to Jesus. And everything you focus on in life is about Jesus. So because of that, there will be a change in your life. And there will be things in your life that you will give up, that you will reject, that you will say, why? I don't even understand why I like this. Woo! Thank God. Amen. You move forward, all right? So... Abiding in His Word will change and transform you, all right? That's, who, that's what God has called us, all right? But to, to, for the Word to be working in you, and I shared that last Sunday, for the Word of God to work in you, then you always has to be a doer of His Word. And in the book of James, chapter 1, last Sunday I shared that, uh, verse 22, it says, be, But be doers of the Word. And not hearers only, deceiving yourself. I mean, just imagine this. Why did James wrote this? That means there are Christians in the church today just reading the word, but not doer of the word. So James, I like him because he's straightforward, man. I like to be like him, just straightforward, right? And he just say to you, he said, be a doer of the word. In verse 23, he said, for if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like a man who looks intensely at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away at once, forget what he was like. I, mean, I, I believe most of us here, when we look at the mirror, that's a purpose, all right? And we will not walk away if there's a dirt or there's something need to be done on our face or our hair or something. We're not going to look at the mirror and say, oh, there's some poop there. Ah, it's okay. No, 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 no. We're going to clean it out. We're going to do something about it, all right? And that's why they say, a doer, do something about it, all right? In verse 25, he said, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserves being no hearer, who forget, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. He will be blessed in his life. He will be blessed whatever God called him to do. He will be blessed because God is with him. And that come back to Joshua. Remember Joshua? Meditate on the word of the Lord so that you will be careful to do everything that's written in it. Come back to that same thing here. All right? Success in the house of the Lord, in the kingdom of God, always come back to this. You can have a lot of money, a lot of cars, a lot of business, or contacts, all those things. That is not success in the eyes of the Lord. The success is this. Are you doing, are you practicing what you learn from the Holy Spirit? Are you a doer of His Word? All right, number two, it's not just abiding in, in Christ and His Word, but love. Love. God is love. And, and He has called us to love one another. And, and the Bible tells us in John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus Himself said this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. All right? As I have loved you. So Christ loved us first. So He showed us by His example. Now He said, now, you got it. Now go and love one another. Verse 35, by this, all will know that you are my disciple. So the connection between loving one another and being a disciple of Christ is one. So if you love another, you will be Christ's disciple. Because you demonstrate Christ's character, his attribute. 
And, and if you say, I want to be his disciple, but I don't want to love, then you cannot be Christ's disciple. So to be Christ's disciple, not just abiding in Christ and his word, but to walk in love. And to walk in love is not just to love God with all our heart, but to love one another. You know, it's easier for any Christian to confess, I love you, Jesus. Now, love this person. Oh, no, I don't know about that. That person irritates me. That person I don't agree with. That person, you know, we have all excuses, but it, there's no excuses in loving one another. All right? And loving one another is a choice. It's not a feeling. And loving one another is not about agreeing with the person, but still you show the love of Christ. It doesn't matter. In the world today, we are taught, if you disagree, that means you don't love. If I disagree, that means, if I disagree with you, that means I don't love you. No, no, no. I always tell people, I disagree with you totally, 100%. I still love you. Yes. Because through Christ's love, we, will, we are able to love in spite of everything else we disagree or whatever. That's why Jesus said, love your enemy. How is that possible? Through Christ's love, we are able to love the enemy. And enemy is not just we disagree. They are trying to kill us. But we still call to love. That is such powerful. Jesus showed that as, in, uh, as an example when he was hanging on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. I mean, that is talking about forgiving, showing love to those that try to kill you. Those that cause pain in your life. Jesus showed that example, example in, on the cross. So we are called to love. And that love has to be in our life if we want to make disciples. Everything Christ did and everything he does is in love. Because God is love. And he has called us to do the same thing. That's why I told people, I don't hate people. I may disagree with you. I may say no to you. But I don't hate people. People that hate me, I don't hate them because it's not worth it. There's nobody on this earth worth me sacrificing my salvation. Nobody. Christ died for me, so I'm not going to sacrifice that. I will continue to love. And the third thing about discipleship is not just abiding in Christ's word and uh, abiding in Christ and his word, not only walking in love, but in discipleship making. And we all know this because Scott Roberts have talked about it, is bearing fruit. That's right. All right? Making disciples is bearing fruits. All right? In the book of um, John chapter 15, verse 8, it says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciple. You see that? So one of the characteristics of a disciple is to bear fruit. All right? And we are not talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, even though that is the work of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us. But in the context of this, we are talking about bearing fruits through disciple making. We are talking about planting seed that will bear fruit. You know, a disciple plants seed into another person, another person. And that person then grow up, become a tree and bear fruit. And the person start planting and then slowly we'll see so many trees bearing fruits. And that's what it's talking about. Bearing fruit through disciple making, all right? And, and in the same chapter here, in uh, uh, John chapter 15, um, in the first, uh, verse, first verse 1 and verse 2, Jesus started in verse, uh, John chapter 15 by saying this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That means if you are a nominal Christian and the only thing you want to achieve as a Christian is come on Sunday morning. And just to enjoy yourself on Sunday morning, whether fellowship, whether the sermon, whether the music, whatever. And that's all you want to do. And not thinking about bearing fruit. That means affecting, imparting uh, in, uh, uh, your life of Christ into somebody else so that that person now can also bear fruit. And the fruit that we're talking about is eternal. It has everlasting effect. That means it brings eternal life and it brings eternal life, eternal life to another person. And let me tell you, that is what we can carry with us one day to heaven, correct? So it's talking about this here, all right? And if we don't do that, 
then we are useless in the kingdom of God. And that means what Christ has done on the cross is wasted. Because, well, in wasted in a sense, Christ, what he had done is not wasted. But we have wasted the precious work of Christ because he's not, he didn't just die for salvation. He died that we may also give life. He, he died so that we can make disciples. So the packet of salvation, part of it is disciple making. It's not just about forgiveness of sin and then, okay, I'm forgiven now. If I die today, I'll go to heaven. Yay! So it's about you. But in that salvation plan of God from the beginning of mankind, it's always about become a light to the world. I mean, look at the Old Testament. God chosen one group of people, the Israelite, to be what? To be a light to the world of who Jehovah God is. All right, that's it. The same in the New Testament. We are called as a church to be a light. So the salvation thing is not just about born again, getting saved, cleansed by the Spirit, washed by the blood of Jesus, and now I'm saved. No, it's not just that. And that's why John talked about it. He said, if you don't bear fruit, he will take it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Okay, I'm not talking about, I'm not, I don't have time to talk about pruning, but that's something God will do in each one, each one of us so that we can bear more fruits, all right? But talking about if you don't bear fruits, if you just decided that as a Christian, you are not going to make disciples, you're just going to live your own life, as long as you feel good about going to a church on Sunday morning and all this thing, let me tell you, your life on earth is all about you, then one day there's no reward for us. And we're going to talk about reward in a few minutes. And all this thing is what God has called us to do in making disciples. But we also know Christ talk about disciple making. That is a cost that we have to count. There's a cost we need to know. There's a cost that will cost pain, a cost that may cost you to pay a lot more than you think, but it's worthwhile. It's worth it because Christ had paid first. Jesus said the cost of disciple making is this. In Luke chapter 14, verse 25, he said, Now great multitude went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. I mean, let me tell you, when I read this verse, when I was a younger Christian, I don't understand it, number one. And number two, I don't receive it. Because I love my parents, I love my thing, despite of everything that was going on as, as a, uh, in my childhood. But I still, they are still my parents. How can I reject them? How can I betray them? And one of my struggles when I became a Christian is that when they find out that I was a Christian, they want to kick me out of Ong family. You know, they want to say, now you're no more Ong because you become a Christian. We don't want you to bear our... Uh, that hurt me. That was like, oh, no, 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 no. And so... To read this, that Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, yes, his own life. It's, the word hate here is it's, it's talking about anyone that does not reject those things that will take first place in our life cannot be the disciple of Christ. That's basically what it's saying here. That means your parents... Your own wife, your own children, and yourself cannot be first. God and His will has to be first in your life if you want to make disciples. And I, I cannot understand this passage until later part of my Christian walk when God called me to mission field. When I have to make decision to leave my family and go to the mission field. When I have to make decision... Even though my grandparents and my parents disagree with me going to mission field, try to bribe me from going to the mission field, try to stop me from going to mission field, 
the devil works extra hard, try to stop me too. But at that, that time, that verse become real. What is more, more important in my life than all these things? It's Jesus. His calling, His will in my life is more important than accepting my mother's, my grandparents' wishes or will or even myself. In fact, one of the excuses I make for rejecting the calling of God to mission field was that, how can I go? My family are not safe yet. I have to be here to make sure they get safe. Then I'll go. You heard the story, the testimony I share, and God spoke to me on that day and said, if you take care of my business, I'll take care of your business. And so I gave up and went to the mission field. And let me tell you, without my doing, God began to work in my family, and slowly, one by one, my mother, my father, my brothers, my sisters, my aunties, my uncles, my grandparents, all became Christian. Not because of my doing. I think if I rejected God's calling and stayed there and thinking that I can get them safe, none of them will be safe. You see that? That's what he's talking about here. You know, God has to be first right. in our life. All right. And again and again, in Luke chapter 9, talk about it, verse 23. And he said to, to all, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I mean, all this a part of disciple making. It's all talk about make sure that Christ is first in our life. Amen. That is the cost of disciple making, all right? And, and talking about Christ is first, and many times to make him first, there will be time we have to give up. Right. We have to totally surrender to the Lord. Give up everything of ourselves and give everything to the Lord, all right? In Luke chapter 14, verse 27 say, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. All right? It's talking about, what is, what is he talking about? Does not bear his cross. What did Jesus have to do to bear his cross? Not my will, but thy will be done. Remember at the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, God, if, he, if it's possible, I don't want to go through this pain and suffering. But... Not my will, but thy will be done. So anyone who wants to become a disciple of Christ have to crucify his will and let God's will be done in his life. And God's will are perfect, are wonderful. It's a blessing. It's a joy. It's a, it's a wonderful journey that we can be in his will. Don't let the devil lie to you that, oh, if you walk in God's will, you will suffer the rest of your life. Nonsense. Yes, you may suffer physical pain sometimes. But let me tell you, the everlasting joy and peace that you have is better than anything else. Amen. Hallelujah. And that is what it's all about. And let me tell you, living a holy life, living a holy life for the Lord, living a life of testimony for God, many times will cause pain and persecution in your life. It will. The world will persecute you because of your lifestyle. They will say things about you that will undermine you or put you down because of your stand for Christ. But hey, we are here not to please people. Let me tell you, those people that I have tried to please growing up, where are they today in my life? I've done their will and they are not even here today in my life. I wasted how many years following them. It's true. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, say, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. The world will persecute you. It doesn't matter. They may say things, spit at you, shout at you, fire you from your job because of your stand for Christ. It doesn't matter because there's only one person you want to please is Jesus Christ. If you open one door, he can open another door. If another door closed, he opened another door. I mean, our life belongs to him. If I have to sacrifice my salary, my job, and everything so that I can stand for Christ, so let it be. That's who we are. That's who we are. That's what it's all about. The year of great courage. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. It takes us to forsake ourselves. It takes us to crucify ourselves. It takes us... To make Jesus Christ Lord of our life, King of our life, in order to go and make disciples. This is just fundamental thing in our life that God has called us to do. 
all of us as Christians, this is who we are. That's what God has called us to do. And we need to move into that. As we move into that, we will start seeing our life change, transform, and we start making disciples. And let me tell you, in five years' time down the road, and you start making disciples, and you look at those people that you have touched and their life have changed, and maybe one of them has become a pastor, or another person has become an evangelist, another person become the new Billy Graham, or this and that, and you look at it and say, oh, I, I, I taught that guy. Me. God used me. You'll be so proud of yourself. But, and it's a good thing. That's what we are proud of. Not because of riches of the world, but we are proud of ourselves because we sacrifice. We stand for Jesus and someone saw it and now they follow God because of you, your life, your testimony. I tell you, I, that, that's what kept me going as a pastor. If it's not because of that, I have given up being a pastor a long time ago. How many times I told Connie, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. People saying things about me. Sometimes in the office, people will say things to me. I want to stand up. I say, you thank God that I'm a pastor. Or else right now, I'll grab this chair and I'll hit you. But that's all in my mind. <laughs> I say, in Jesus' name, get out of my mind. <laughs> and I sat there across the people. I said, let me pray for you. Jesus, God love you. And you know what? Because you never, you never know that, that ways that you choose to act. That, that lifestyle that you choose to do may be painful inside of you, but hey, it will affect the person. You, know, you don't know when, how, but it will affect. That's why it's so important not to react, but to act in Christ Jesus, because that's who we are, a disciple of Christ. And the reward that God has for each and every one of us is more than we deserve. More than we deserve. Of course, the first reward that we have, being a disciple of Christ, is eternal life. John 3.16 tells us, right? Jesus came that we may have eternal life, all right? And, and how can we continue in that eternal life that he has given to us is to make disciples. To be honest with you, people ask me this question. What guarantee did I have that I'll make it to the end of this journey? I'll make it to heaven. I say make disciple, Because <laughs> let me tell you, when you have to make disciple, it makes you think, Oh, I better not do this because somebody is looking at me, you know. I better act correctly. I better act like Christ because I have people looking at me. At home, you know, at home, you sometimes you have kids. And sometimes you act a certain way because you don't want your kids to grow up following that bad thing. You want them to. So sometimes you, you, you push yourself to act better in front of your kids because you want your kids to grow up to be a man or woman of God. Right? So the same thing when you're discipling someone, it kind of like puts you in the right place. You know? It put you, it, it, it kind of motivates you, challenge you. It's kind of like telling you, it's like, hey, people's life is at stake. You are holding it. You better be serious about it. All right? and, and so the eternal life that we have, that God has given us, is precious because it was purchased through the blood of Jesus. And we can give that life that Christ gave us to another person to disciple making. Now, why did Christ say make disciple? Even though we know we have to make converts first. We have to, make, we have to get somebody, somebody born again before making disciple. Because if he stopped just getting people saved, none of us will make disciple. Right. We're like, believe in Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Whew. One safe, one down. You know. But making disciple is like giving birth. It's like a lot of hard work, a lot of challenges, a lot of things we have to put into that person to see that person grow up to be a man and woman of God. Hallelujah. You know, I share about the world will persecute you because of who you are, because of what you stand for. I talk about, you know, we have to sacrifice, we have to give up, we have to surrender. Talking about denying our flesh, we're talking about giving up our will, our plans, our dreams, so that God's dream and God's plan can be real in our life. And all this thing, we don't have to be afraid of it. Because His peace is so powerful. 
Christ's peace is so powerful. His peace will guard us, protect us. His peace will give us the strength that we need. And it's not just His peace, but the joy of the Lord. I mean, look at uh, John chapter 14, verse 27. Say, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. That's talking about peace. And then in John chapter 15, verse 11, and in the same context that we just read about discipleship, about making disciples and bearing fruit and all this. And in this verse, in verse 11, say, This thing I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. So the reward that we have and the resources that we have in, in making disciples and being a disciple of Christ is tremendous. Just the eternal life that we inherit, it has plenty. And now we're talking about the peace and the joy that God gave us as we move forward to make disciple. And of course, the last thing is the love of Christ. The love of Christ should compel us to want to make disciple. The love of Christ should compel us to reach out to the lost. The love of Christ should compel us to want to do something. And that's what I pray every day. I say, God, Please, let your love compel me, move me, challenge me, slap me, do whatever you Let me go and love somebody. And loving somebody is what God has called us to do. Amen. In Mark chapter 10, verse 29, I'll leave this to you before we take a break. So Jesus answered and say, Surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. It's talking about on earth here. The blessing of the Lord will be upon us right here on earth, not just in heaven, but on earth here because of your sacrifices for the Lord. And in this verse, he's saying, God said this, I will not forget your sacrifices. I have, I have seen it. I know what you have done for my kingdom and for my sake. And I will bless you. And I can stand here before you and declare that. I can stand here and declare that God has blessed me. God has blessed me. I have three wonderful kids and now almost 11 grandkids. I mean, what else can a man want? I mean... A beautiful, wonderful wife that support me. Yes, and obey me. <laughs> Hallelujah. We shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and land with persecution. I mean, and in the age to come, eternal life. It's talking about the blessing that God will have upon each and every one of us. So we are not alone in this journey. We are not alone in doing this thing. You know, God is with us. Amen. And that's what in Matthew chapter uh, 28 verse 20 say. And lo, behold, he say, I will be with you to the end of the age. I mean, yeah. that promise that he gave us in the context of the verse is talking about going and making disciples. And it's not talking about the books. It's talking about going to make disciples for Christ, teaching them everything that you know. It, we are not depending on a book. Thank God for the book. But no matter where we are, with the book or without the book, we are called to make disciples. We are called to give our life as we give to Christ, give to somebody else. And that is what God has called us. And this is what this year, 2021, we want to do in ICC, we want to move strongly forward. We want people in this church to catch this vision to make disciples. Amen? Now, um, in the second part of this seminar, I'm going to talk about the upgrade version um, about discipleship. Um, before we do that, um, we're going to take a few minutes of break. Uh, if you need to have coffee, I don't know if there's any more coffee, uh, but um, you can use the restroom if you want, and then Take about five minutes or so, and then we'll come back, and then we'll go to the second part of uh, the seminar. All right. God bless you. Praise God. All right. The second part of the seminar, we're going to talk about ICC discipleship journey. All right. Let's put the PowerPoint, the first PowerPoint, the definition of a disciple that ICC. This is ICC definition of discipleship. All right. A surrendered 
to the Lord, to the Lordship of Jesus and obey all the teaching of Jesus Christ. That's that's what our definition of discipleship, being a disciple, is is someone that surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus and someone that obeys all the teaching of Jesus Christ. And of course, imparting that into somebody's life, all right? That is um, what we're talking about. Now, um, from now on, we're going to call this program, Discipleship Thing, that we have uh, ICC Discipleship Journey, all right? Because it's a journey that we are taking as a disciple of Jesus Christ, all right? And so in this journey, we are different levels that we want you to go through, all right, in your discipleship making, all right? Um, step to your discipleship journey, and in the statement of ICC uh, on the website, you'll see that uh, this is just three main things here, to know, to grow, and to go, all right? This is who we are in ICC. This is the journey that we take to know Him, all right, to grow in Him, and to go and make disciple. all right? So that is who we are. That's the statement of ICC, our mission statement uh, in ICC. Now, so now we talk about the new upgrade discipleship journey that we have. Now, we are, not, we are still calling the book Discipleship Training Program, but this whole thing that we are doing, the new thing we are doing is called ICC Discipleship Journey. Now, the next slide here... Uh, you, if you look carefully, this is what the journey is all about, all right? This is the journey, that the new journey that we want everyone in ICC to go through it. Now, I'm going to explain this to you. In fact, I forget to give this to everybody. Yeah, you can hand up. So that everybody can get a copy of this, this thing. And this is important. And now that you get the copy, I'm going to explain to you. Now, in this journey, and, and by the way, everything that we are doing right now, the new version, the upgraded version, um, this is something that we are moving into for the next few years. And as, as the church starts growing and we see some of the things that we have to improve or upgrade, we will let you know. But this is the first um, step that we are taking, all right, in moving forward. And I'm going to explain to you in a few minutes once you get all this paper all right. Now, this year, actually it's from last year, um, actually it started with Cassandra. Uh, as you know, Cassandra is in Bible school right now, taking her degrees in theological study. And one of the classes that she had to take is discipleship. All right. What is discipleship? And she came and, in, well, I won't say interview me. She came and talked to us about discipleship in ICC and so forth. And as we are talking and we are discussing about the meaning of discipleship, as we are talking about what ICC embraces and, and what we are doing as a church in terms of discipleship, then I realized, whoa, there's a lot of loophole. There's a lot of things we have to upgrade and improve for us to truly make disciple. And one of the questions that I ask myself is this. How far have we gone in discipleship making? And what are some of the problems that we have in truly making a disciple. And some of this question lead me to do this upgrade version of discipleship because I realize most of the people in this church that have gone through discipleship training program are focusing mainly on the book. They are teaching the book well. They're going through the book with a disciple. They finish level one, level two, and level, level three. And a lot of them have finished level three in this church. But yet I've seen that all those people, they have grown in knowledge, but not really grown in discipleship making. And then I say to myself, so what is missing in our discipleship in ICC? It's not the teaching. We have it. I have seen people grow and see people use the book and people, in fact, improve on it themselves, on the book, depending who they are teaching. 
But I see the lacking in the discipleship making in this church in mentorship. I see the lacking is mentorship. And mentorship go beyond the book. All right? And so I thought to myself, okay, that is our problem. We are not mentoring the people. We are teaching the people. We are not mentoring. And so our failure, not the book, is that we are not promoting enough in terms of asking people to go beyond the book is mentoring the disciple, disciple that is given to them. And, and I'm going to talk about it in the last session on mentoring. But on this uh, uh, discipleship journey, I want to share with you, this is the journey we want everyone to go through it. Now, the first one is discipleship training program. That is what we have been doing. All right? And level one, level two, and level three. And we want everyone in this church, if we can, to go through this discipleship training program, level one, level two, level three. Now, this level one, two, three discipleship training program will be enough to give them a little bit of foundation in their Christian walk and help them to begin to make disciples using this discipleship training program. And, and as you know, the book is designed in such a way, it's like a skeleton that you can add meat, a lot more meat, depending who you're discipling. So you, as you disciple someone that may be an older Christian or maybe uh, someone that is want to know more, then you can add more meat in the discipleship thing. But it helps us at uh, uh, the first level to make disciple. all right? Now, the question that I have is this. What happened at the end of level three? And a lot of people in this church have gone through level three and they have finished level three and they're like, what is next? All right. And, and I also see that because we don't have anything to follow up after that. So what happened is that if you are discipling someone level three and you finish it, then you say bye to the person and then that's it. So we don't want that to happen anymore. We want this to be a journey. That means when you're discipling someone, it's not depending on the level three. That means there's a journey that, will, that you have to continue on maybe for years to come. All right? And this will help us like, a, like an arrow pointing us a direction where we can continue in our journey of growing in the Lord. Now, this is just one part of discipleship making, all right? This is the journey that we want you to go through. So if you have gone through level one, level two, level three, the next thing we want you to go is to go to the next level. It's called Christian Growth Program. This is just a name, all right? I may change the name, but this is just a name that I put off, just to, to know where we are going to the next level, okay? So discipleship training program for first level. The second level is Christian Growth Program And in that program, you now can take classes to help you to grow and to be a better Christian, all right? Now, we have offered, now we will be offering four classes on this level. After you finish level three, you will then take the next level and there will be four classes. And you cannot jump from one class to another class. You have to systematically follow the order of the class that offered to you. So the, the next level, after level three, in Christian Growth Seminar, the first class you have to take is prayer. There will be between um, nine to 12 lessons, depending on how we are doing it. Right now, I have a lesson prepared uh, on prayer, a 12 lesson, so you might have to take the 12 lesson. The question we always have is that, how can we make these classes available and possible in this church? Number one, it's difficult because we don't have classroom. Number two, Sunday service, um, you know, people have worship, they have this and that. So many things is going on on Sunday. So Sunday is not really good. And then other days we have primary thing, we have live group. So how can we make this possible for them to continue to grow? So one of the ideas that, we'll, that I have is that we can video this lesson. So the teachers will be teaching this lesson, and we're going to video it, and then we're going to put it online so that when you are on that level, you can take that, those classes. Let's say you finish level three, and the next class is prayer. Then you go to prayer, uh, the video on prayer and watch it. And when you finish at the end of the classes, you will be given a test. All right? 
Don't worry, it's very simple. It's very simple. Just to make sure that you actually watch the video, that's all. It's not about your understanding of the scripture. It's not to test you, see whether you have the ability. And No, 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 no nothing. Just say, oh, I, this person actually finished level. The, the, all the lesson, all right? So maybe we have 10 questions, uh, and each question will be taken from one of the lesson, you know? And uh, we have a lot of good teachers in our church. We have Tom, we have Pastor Rick and Colleen that will be asked to teach some of these classes, and we'll video them, or they can video themselves if they want to, and then we will download it online, and then when you are on that level, you can go. Now, if you finish prayer, if you, you let's say you uh, have a lot of time, you're free, nothing to do. You finish prayer, and then you go to the Word, the next class, all right? And then after the Word, there's principle of witnessing. Now, of course, the principle of witnessing is talking about how we have to be a witness for Christ. And in the lesson, we are hoping you to put it into practice. That means you're going to go out and try to witness to someone, all right? If your husband is not safe, then that's the best bet. Say, husband, I need to do a test. I need to do a practice here. Can I witness to you about Jesus Christ? <laughs> or, or your neighbors, your friends, your family members. And, and some of the people that I practice on when I was a younger Christian in witnessing is some of my buddies that I grew up with and my family members. My, my mom was the first one because she listened to me. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, I witnessed to her and she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. Is it? So you can practice. It's not about the result. It's about you being a witness. We can't produce the result. Only Jesus can produce that result. But in order to produce that result that God wants to, He used us as an instrument. And you are just an instrument. So don't, don't think anything else other than that. You are just an instrument. All right? And the result comes not because of instrument, because of God making it happen. And then the fourth class is freedom in Christ. And we have lesson on that. But just recently, my mother-in-law has been doing through Zoom this class, Freedom in Christ. Of course, she's the best teacher. It's my favorite teacher. So we might use her classes, Freedom in Christ, to be in this uh, class. All right. If you have gone through this class, God bless you. Then you don't have to take it. All right. Yeah, but that's, that's it. And we hope in order, uh, uh, the reason why we put prayer, the word, principle, uh, witnessing, and freedom is because we felt that as a Christian, especially younger Christian, this is some of the fundamental thing about the, what they need to believe and do. Now, the principle of witnessing is important even as a young Christian because it's a testimony that you bring to your friend, your family members. When I was as a young Christian, I don't know much about the Bible. But one thing I know, I have to be a witness for Christ. Whoever told me that, he said, at home, you are, you are a light in your home. You are the light of Christ. Be a witness. And let me tell you, I don't know much, but I know one thing. I have a testimony. And I can share that testimony and people get saved. Amen. And then the, the, the third level is Christian maturity program. So we see a growth and now we see a maturity. That means this person have grown into a maturity uh, to be a more solid Christian. Uh, maybe three years to five years old as a Christian and now they go to a next level. And in the class for the, this level is Christian character and conducts. All right. We now teaching the people how to behave as a Christian. Not an ICC idea, but what the Bible teaches us, all right? How we as a Christian need to act, how behave, and so forth. I mean, I thank God one of my uh, brothers in Christ came to me as a young Christian and said to my face, you stop using the F word. I'm like, oh, is it wrong? Yes, as a Christian, we don't use F word. We say we use B word. No, no. <laughs> uh, we use, don't use any A, B, C word or whatever. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I didn't know that as a Christian. I still use something, you know, uh, and some of our behaviors that we don't know is wrong. And someone have to point to us, tell us, this is not Christian. We don't act this way. We don't say this thing or do this, you know. And then the second uh, class, principle of love, and then Roman and Galatian. I, I, I believe these classes... Um, uh, now, for example, uh, one of the things about this live group lesson that we have is on Galatians uh, for the next three months, all right? So that class actually came from, that notes came from here. And so when we Roman and Galatians, that, that 
notes will be given to uh, people uh, to teach and also uh, people that have gone through it in the life group, they may not need to go through that, all right? We use that too because the book of Romans and Galatians is such a powerful book uh, for us to understand about salvation, about who we are in Christ Jesus, all right? And then the fourth one is mission and then worship, the purpose of church, and all these are important. And then, and then as, you, as the people start growing in maturity, we are hoping then they start moving in the leadership position, whether it's life group leaders, ministry leaders, or associate leaders, or uh, whatever leaders' position. Or maybe they are desiring to move forward in their lives to serve God in leadership position, in a team leader for, to organize this or organize that. And all those um, uh, things that we have in our church, uh, we want to help them to grow in the, into that level. All right, Christian leadership uh, program is designed for not just for maturity, but to, for people that actually want to serve the Lord in um, leadership. Now, taking this class doesn't make you a leader, doesn't guarantee you a place of leadership, but it's just a place that you can grow uh, to be a leader if, you, uh, if God allowed you to be. All right, some of the classes that we offer on this one is Fruit of the Spirit, uh, Jesus and the Gospel, Faith and the Supernatural, uh, Strategy for Living, the Gift of the Holy Spirit, Hebrews, the Book of Hebrews. And then the next one is, I call it Pastoral Leadership Program, where now you will be uh, in the level of pastoral, and usually a live group leaders will be considered that level. A live group leaders is... It's uh, many pastors in this church that pastor a small group of people uh, that is given to them. And this is the level that most life group leaders should be in, all right? Uh, and that's why we want them to be, all right? And in that level, uh, we, they will be, there will be classes offered to them in ministry practice, uh, principal counseling, Pauline epistle, general epistle, pastoral epistle, pentateuch, and church planting. The church planting is extra because that's our vision of ICC. You know, we want to see church planting. We hope through life groups, leaders, and, and future leadership uh, leaders in this church, we can get some of them to send them out to the mission field to do church planting, whether it's domestic or international. And that's why we, that's our heart uh, mission. A vision for mission is to see that happen. And that's what I, I was sharing on, on Wednesday about Deepak and Alicia, uh, or, or Live Group, brother. Um, that, you know, that's what we want to see. Somebody like them as an example in this church that grew, grew in this house, uh, served in this house, uh, and then also one day then to be sent out and hopefully one day to plant a church, if God's will. All right, and so this is the journey that we want people to go through um, as they as they grow in maturity. Now, going through all this ICC discipleship journey doesn't make you a mature Christian just because you go through it. All right. I want you to know that because I know some people say, I've gone through every single classes that ICC offer. I'm the most mature person. No, no. Maturity in Christ does not depend on this. This helps you to grow in maturity, but there's a lot more play, uh, things play in the maturity of a Christian, all right? And as you all know, there are different stages that we go through as a Christian, all right? Um, and I'm going to go to the next slide here to show you some of the stages, all right? Uh, I put these stages, and I got this from di different books that I read. And one of the books that Cassandra showed to me is by, what's the name of the guy? I can't remember now. Real Church, a pastor of the uh, church, Real Church in Idaho. Anyway, his book, and I, I like his book on that. Um, and he, his church are very strong in discipleship, a little bit different than us, but still very strong in discipleship making. All right, now there are different stages of of growth that we have as Christian, all right? Uh, Pre-believers, pre that's number one. That means someone that is, have the potential to get saved uh, and become a Christian. And so maybe you're witnessing to someone, sharing the gospel with someone, and the potential is there for them to become a Christian. And some of you may be discipling a non-Christian through the book. And by lesson seven or eight, you're like, whoa. Now it's about Jesus, salvation, and they should come to know Jesus Christ. And then after that, the, is, the next level is baby believers. Okay, this is what we call a born-again experience, and this is 
This is who uh, people now suddenly become, you know. And, and sometimes it can be like you've been to church for years following your parents or you've been in church for years because you were taught to go to church, but you never really have a born-again experience. And one day someone told you and someone tell you or a preacher or something, and then suddenly you say, oh, I've never really given my heart to Jesus. And then that day you say, Jesus, come into my life. I don't care how many years you've been to church and who you follow to church to. You are baby believers because you just got saved. You may have more understanding of Christianity or the Bible, but you are still a baby Christian because you just accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all right? And as a baby Christian, you start growing just like a natural baby. The baby has to be fed and has to start growing, all right? Now, and I'm going to talk about the characteristics so that you know what I'm talking about. And then the, the, the next one is growing believers and disciple and mature disciple, all right? Now, let's quickly go to the next one. Uh, characteristic of pre-believers, of course, we just talked about it. One may and may not believe in Christ or God. They may think that there are many ways to go to God. Uh, they may think they are spiritual, and they may think that they know God, but they have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They think they're a good person, and all these are talking about pre-believers people, all right? They may think that uh, they are higher power, but not so sure what is that, all right? And all those things, you can read it. Uh, that's pre-believers, all right? And the, 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 the second one is baby believers. They have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, they are new believers, uh, all are long-time believers, but life is still all about themselves. Okay, this is baby Christian. That means it's, it's, it's not just they're newly saved, but sometimes they can be in church for a long time. And they're born again, they're saved, but, they're, but their life never changed. They're still the same person before they got saved. And until now, it's the same. That means everything is about them. These people are still babies. They may be in church for five years or ten years even, but they are still baby Christian because they have no idea about God as much as themselves. Um, they are Lord of their own life. They, begin, they are beginning to learn the truth. Uh, there are f f phrases that they might have. I need to go to church regularly. Uh, uh, I never heard that before. I need to read the Bible regularly or pray. A question mark, actually. My eyes. Uh, I don't need anything, anyone else. It is just me and Jesus. All these phrases that people taught you, it, it, it kind of like saying that, oh, yeah, this is still baby Christian. All right? Now, sitting here, if you think that you, you are one of them, then you know your level now. All right? <laughs> okay. All right. A growing believers is like moving from a baby Christian to a growing believers. All right? A growing believer is someone that is growing in their relationship with God and others. Not just God, but with others, all right? They are applying God's Word to their life and allowing others to walk with them. Talking about discipleship, correct? Someone that has been disciple, a disciple. Uh, however, it is still mostly about themselves, their needs, and their comfort. That's baby Christian, all right? They are developing habits of Bible study and prayer. They're growing. They have hunger for the word, all right? Uh, phrases that you might hear, I love my church because I feel like I belong. All right? I love my church because I feel like I belong. Sound great, but it shows also they are growing. The church is not just about them, right? Uh, I'm upset about my life group being split up because they are many, because these are my closest friends. They're upset. I, how many people got upset when I split the life group, right? So now they are growing believers. They are not matured yet. Uh, I, I don't know if this church is meeting my needs anymore. Have you heard that? Maybe I should change churches so my needs are met. It's about him again, about them again, all right? So they are growing. They are not matured yet, all right? If you say you are matured and you are saying this thing, that means you come back one level down. You are growing believers. You are not matured. No one ever say hi to me at church. No one ever call me to see how I'm doing. <gasps> no one spend time with me. The pastor don't care about me. I can't click with anyone in this church. 
I don't have any friend. Have you seen people talk about that? Okay, they are not mature. They are growing. All right, if you are in this level, this is who you are, the second level, a growing believer, a third level. All right, okay, let's go to the next level. Uh, this is for where we want to be. Characteristic of a disciple. We are called to be a disciple. So we are born again. We someone disciple us. We grow. It's like someone feeding us meal through discipleship, and we are like growing the word of God. We're changing from our cell to God's cell. We are changing from our cell, our focus to God focus, and then we are growing as a believers. And and slowly, slowly, we've been changed and transformed. And this is where we want to be a disciple of Christ. All right. This, the characteristic is they are making a shift from being self-focused to more others-focused, all right? They are beginning to understand themselves as ministers of the gospel, all right? It's no more about myself. The focus is no more me, 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 me. It's about others and the church. They are giving their time, money, and gifting uh, with thankfulness, all right? That means they don't need people to thank them. They know who they are. Uh, they understand the kingdom purpose of branching out, all right? They understand it's not just about them, it's about the kingdom of God, about expanding the kingdom of God, all right? Uh, the phrases they might use, in my devotion, I came across something I would love to discuss. I have three friends, I'm sharing the gospel, and I want to invite them to live group. Wow, see that? That means they're disciples. They are thinking about... Getting other people to live group, getting other people to church, you know. Um, Jane and, and Bill miss live group and Sunday. I will text them and call them to find out if they are okay, if they need anything. Have you done this before? If you see someone in not, not in church on Sunday, when you go home on Sunday afternoon or evening or the next day, do you text them? A, a true disciple will. Especially if someone you're discipling, 100%, you have to. All right? That's one of the things that you have to do in mentoring someone. You have to make sure they're okay. If they're not there, why? Are you sick? Are you okay? You know, and if they miss three Sundays in a row, they may say, okay, you got to visit them. You got to call them. You got to meet up with them because something is not right. Um, I love serving and seeing others grow in Christ. You see? I love serving and seeing other people grow in Christ. I love to be involved in a mission trip. I like to go. I want to have more uh, burden for mission. I want to give to mission. All these are part of characteristic of a disciple. That's where we want to be, all right? We want to grow from a baby Christian to a disciple of Christ Jesus, all right? This is just a little bit of characteristic and phrases that, that they use, all right? Now, characteristic of a mature disciple. That is Someone that has been in Christ a longer time. You cannot be a mature Christian in a two-year period. You may know a lot. You may be 100% dedicated to the Lord, on fire for Jesus. But to be a mature Christian, it takes experience with the Lord and in the Lord. So it takes a longer time for people to reach this level. Now, I have no um, time frame for this thing. I'm not saying you're going to be 20 years old Christian to be that. No, no, I'm not saying that. Or you're going to be 10 years old. No, no. I, the maturity of someone depending on that person growth in the Lord, all right? I remember when I was two years old Christian, I, I'm more mature than most people in the church. You know why? Because I gave my life totally to the Lord in every area. And so it, it's natural process, a, a progression that if you gave more, it's like a footballer. If you train a lot every day, you'll be a better footballer. You know, it's just a natural. If you give more, you grow faster. It's compared with someone that only give a little bit of their time, of their energy to the Lord, they'll grow slower. I mean, that's part of it, all right? But to be a mature Christian, it takes time, all right? So the reason I'm saying that, because I don't want you to have wrong ideas. Oh, I've been in the church for 20 years. I should be in this level. You may not be. All right, uh, they have a solid understanding of God's word and deep abiding relation with the Father. That's number one. Is that mature disciple and a mature Christian is someone that know who they are in Christ Jesus. They have strong relationship with the Lord. They are living out God's word word in their life daily. They are others focused and God dependent. All right, that's the characteristic. They are able to reproduce. 
mature disciples of Christ. They are not selfish. They are always looking to reproduce. Follow me as I follow Christ type of thing, all right? And they are always producing someone, all right? No matter where they are, they are always influencing others for Jesus Christ. They understand their role as one who need to intentionally invest in others, uh, making disciples who can then make other disciples. Uh, phrases they might say, I wonder if God is leading me to invest in Bill and help him mature in his faith. All right? So if you have that thought come to you, wow, I think, I, I think maybe God is leading me to help this person, to help the person to grow. It shows a, a maturity in you to even have that thought or to entertain the thought. Because most young Christians will not have that thought. If their thought comes to them, they'll just push it away. But a mature Christian would take it in and say, oh, maybe God wants me to do that. And I need to obey God and do that, all right? Uh, my neighbors doesn't know Christ, and I need to be more intentionally intentional in letting them know about Jesus. I know I can't do this on my own. I'm accountable to my leaders. Oh, I like this one. <laughs> all right. All right. And, 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 and we're talking about discipleship. We're talking about different level of maturity. You know, one thing as a pastor, and I say this before, and I'm going to say it again, is this, that people need to learn to trust their leaders. And for some reason, the last 25 years or more uh, in the church, people don't trust leadership anymore. The respect for pastors have gone down tremendously for one reason or another, but it should not be. Our trust in our leadership does not depend on what happened around us. It does not depend on because another pastor fall into sin. So because of that, I can't trust leaders. No, no, no. Just like love, you choose to love. It's in spite of everything else. It's not, it's not something that based on others or anything. It, no, no, the, because the Bible tells us. And so we want to, to, to honor our leaders because God bless us. We want to respect our leaders. And in this church, this is who we are. We want that. And, and one of the examples I want to give is because, because it happens so many times in this church, is this. People make decisions before coming to their leaders to pray about things. You know, people come to me and say, Pastor, uh, can I talk to you about my, uh, uh, something we want to do? They already decided. They're just informing me. And I'm sitting across... There's nothing to say. Thank you for the information. But the way, to, the, the, the proper way is that God, uh, Pastor, you know, um, we're thinking and praying about this. Can you pray along with us? Can you help us? Can you counsel us? We don't want to make mistakes. And then the pastor will pray and say, this is what we think about it. This is what we felt the Lord saying. Now it's up to you to choose at the end of the day. We'll never force you. But at least you give the respect and the opportunity for the pastor to minister to you. So that is what, how it should be when we talk about respect. And so when someone do that, I thought, okay, you're not mature enough yet. That's why you're acting this way. But the problem is that everybody thinks that they can hear from the Lord. But not everything that comes to your mind is from the Lord. You know? Not everything that you want to do comes from the Lord. All right? So that's why we need to be accountable to our leaders. All right? I want to be consistent in my testimony to those around me. I want to be an influencer in my workplace. All of these are talking about someone that have come to a place of a mature disciple of Jesus Christ. And that's where we want to be. That's our goal, all right? And so the reason why I'm putting this is this. I want the church, as we are moving forward in this discipleship journey, I want people to know that just because you disciple, just before you're taking classes, just because you do this and do that, doesn't make you a mature person. There are characteristics, there are things that will determine whether you are mature or not. And please do not go around and tell, me, and tell people, I think I'm the mature disciple now. All right, there's no name here. This is just something I put, all right? All right, it's like someone came to me, uh, I think I'm an apostle. I say, what make you an apostle? I, because I felt God telling me I'm an apostle. No. The only reason you become an apostle is because someone tells you you're an apostle, not you tell yourself apostle. So the same thing, you can't tell someone, I'm a mature. No, no, someone tell you you're mature based on the characteristic. And this is just a little bit of it. But our goal is to go where God has called us to be. All right? Now, talking about growth, 
uh, the next slide. Um, how do we know, how do we as assess, um, how do we know uh, our growth? How do we um, evaluate our growth? Now, for me, every year, at the end of the year, I will sit down and think about my growth, the transformation in my life, what God has done this year for me, what character that I have to change, that I have changed, or what God is doing in me, what is, am I struggling in my character, what is, in all those things, I, I take time to sit down and reflect and, and see where I'm going. This year, I'm not growing because I've been stubborn. Because I have unforgiveness, because I'm offended, all, all those things. Then I say, God, forgive me because I do not want to be, I don't want to stop growing. I want to grow, all right? This is a journey, all right? And so um, how people held accountable to the growth, spiritual growth assessment for discipleship. So this is number one is that uh, we're going to put it online under the discipleship journey of ICC. And so Later part, not now, so don't go home and look at the thing online and say, well, I don't see it. No, we have not done a single thing about it. But when Brian comes back from his vacation from Philippines, we will sit down and change the website. Uh, and we're going to put this ICC Discipleship Journey. And under that, one of the things is that we're going to give you, uh, you can download it actually. I'm, I'm, I'm still doing it, so uh, this is just a sample of it. Uh, this is the Discipleship Cell Evaluation Assessment. So this uh, paper, you can download it online, and it's, it's, it's two ways. Um, one is for you personally, and you can answer some of the question about yourself, all right? Uh, are you going to church regularly? Are you discipling someone? Are you reading your Bible? You know, all those things help you to start thinking, man, this year I've not been reading the Bible. Or this year I've not been praying enough. Oh, oh uh, are you demonstrating the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Oh, you no, know, not at all, especially patience. I've lost patience with my wife. Oh, okay, something is wrong here. Okay. So it kind of do. And also, this is the same paper that you will evaluate your disciple. All right? You will use it, or you can even uh, tell your disciple to evaluate himself or herself. But you also can use it for your own evalu evaluation and also for your disciple, all right? And so you, I'm, we're going to put this online. That is just to help you so that every year, every few months, every six months maybe, you should do this, something like that, you know, just... Just like, uh, um, I, no, I should not say job performance because we are not performing, but it's, it's more of our spiritual growth in the Lord. It helps us. This questionnaire helps us to think, you know, because sometimes if you think, am I doing okay? Amen. I'm doing fine. Uh, you know, if you're a positive person, yeah, I'm doing so good. But this paper kind of helps you with questionnaire that maybe areas in your life that you don't even know, all right? And I want you to also um, kind of like when you're discipling someone to know where your disciple is and also are you doing a good job discipling the person? This is some of the questionnaire that you can ask yourself. Is he growing the Lord? Is my disciple praying regularly? And if you say, I don't know, that means you need to ask the person. If you say, I don't know, is my disciple praying regularly? Then the next time you disciple, disciple your disciple, you need to say, hey, by the way, brother, how's your prayer life? Are you struggling? Are you feeling, you know, difficult? Do you don't have time? Are you finding it difficult to have that prayer life discipline? What is, is that something? If the person says, yeah, I've been praying every day. I got up every day, 6 o'clock in the morning. I pray in tongue. I do this. I da, da, da. Okay, mark it up. Then you know you're doing a good job. If you're not, then you say, brother, can I pray with you? Can I talk with you about this? Is there a problem that I can help you so that you can pray? It, maybe something is not right somewhere, you know? Uh, so that helps you a bit. So that is how we can assess uh, our, the growth, all right? Our private spiritual growth assessment for live group leaders, all those things that um, we, we, this paper will be put online to help you uh, to, to, do, to know which level you are and how to grow. Now, we're talking about opportunity to grow, uh, to know, to grow, and to go. 
In ICC, we have so much for people to grow into it, all right? Um, I mean, we try to create, without putting extra burden on anyone, we try to create a platform, uh, a place where you can grow spiritually, all right? Now, uh, when we are talking about growth, there are... Uh, let's go to the, the, the slide on Christian growth journey. Now, there are three areas of growth that you ha must have in order to balance your growth properly. It's like having d proper diet in your body to, in, in order for you to grow healthy. So for a Christian to grow healthy, these are the three areas that you must have. Now, so in ICC, we are trying to provide this so that you may grow healthy. Now, the discipleship journey is one of the things that we are promoting, that we are helping you to grow in terms of biblical knowledge. All right? That's number one, biblical knowledge. So discipleship, ICC discipleship journey is one thing that we have created for you to grow in your biblical knowledge. But of course, in the biblical knowledge, uh, uh, the next slide, um, um, Michael, uh, we have live groups that you can grow into. If you go to live group, every time there is a lesson. Now, whether you receive only 10% of the lesson, because the teacher is maybe lousy, maybe you don't understand what he's talking about, and every time you walk away from live group, say, 10% today. Yeah, I understand 10%. That is also something, all right? It's still 10%. Or oh, you walk away that night, you say, wow, today my life group leader did a good job. I got 50%. That's 50%. So it doesn't matter how much you get, you're still getting something. And the Bible says the word of God will go forth and it will come back accomplishing what God designed to accomplish. So, so, life group is one thing we created for growth. Biblical knowledge. Christian Growth Seminar was created for such thing too. And Christian Growth Seminar is based on the fivefold ministry. So, each time when we have Christian Growth Seminar, we are trying to invite one of those office ministry people to come and bless us. Whether it's a prophet, whether it's an apostle, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a pastor, whether he's an um, evangelist, we invite that person to equip the saints, yeah. equip us. That is Christian Growth Seminar, all right? So we try to get the fivefold ministry flowing through this church. That is to help you to grow, biblically speaking, all right? And of course, you have to study the Word, yeah. all right? You have to study. We encourage people to study the Word. Not just reading the Word, but to study. I mean, look at the woman. Bible study. It helps you to study the Word. All right? So all this to help you. All this is to give you um, a platform that you can say, I can jump from here. All right? Now, it's still up to you at the end of the day. We can create another five things in ICC. But it's still up to you whether you want to grow, whether you want to jump, whether you want to move forward. I mean, we can create all the best program in the whole world, and still you can't grow because you don't want to grow, all right? The second thing is personal uh, transformation. So, so a biblical knowledge is a must. Without knowledge, my people perish, all right? So a biblical knowledge is important for us to know God, move forward in understanding of the things of God. The theological study that we have, uh, help us to grow in terms of our relationship and understanding of God. But the second growth that you must have, not just biblical growth, is personal growth. So if you have biblical knowledge without personal growth, then it's off balance. That means your head get bigger and bigger, but your heart getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. So transformation make your heart bigger, all right? So you want your head to be bigger because you're understanding of God, but you also want transformation. And this is some of the things that uh, people go through in personal transformation, all right? Have the person been baptized in water? If they, the person say no, then something is not right in their personal transformation. That means they're still rebellious, stubbornness, or my way, not God's way, or whatever. I know that is something is not right. Or baptism, the Holy Spirit. Have I been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Of course, in ICC, we are 
Pentecostal church that we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe that um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and one of the signs of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongue. All right? There's no other way to, to explain the baptism except that. All right? So we, we want to pray for people to be baptized, those that want. We don't force people. I mean, it's not highway to salvation or to heaven, I mean, but this is a blessing of the Lord, and we want people to have the blessing. And that is also another transformation in our life. Let me tell you, it changed my Christian walk when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, when I began to speak in tongue, all right? Uh, deliverance from habit, prayer life, submission and obedience, being a witness, worship, all those things help us to change us from an old person to a new person. All right. I mean, I can list another hundred things down on personal transformation, on character and everything else. You know, but basically is that the, the personal transformation and experience with God is so vital because it balances up your knowledge. Because knowledge without transformation and personal experience with God is sure that it's just information. But that information can turn and, and become real in your life when there is a personal experience and transformation with the Lord. And the third thing we want to see in our growth, all right, is ministry involvement, all right? And in, in this church, we want to make sure that everyone involved in something. Why? Because we, ministry involvement is talking about giving out, all right? Be a servant of the Lord. The greatest of all is servant of all, right? So, we are talking about ministry involvement is giving up. So we have one knowledge to grow. We have one transformation experience with the Lord to grow. Now we have to grow in ministry involvement because this is where the transformation continues. This is where the knowledge continues. This is where you give out. This is where you choose to love. You choose not to get offended. This is where you choose to say, God, use my gifting. Use my talent that you give me. This is all about, not about you. It's about giving to the kingdom and to the body of Christ. And in this church, of course, we have so many that you can choose to be involved. And we want everyone that come to this church to be involved in some kind of ministry. Do we need everybody? No, we don't need. To be honest with you, to function properly in this church, we only need 25% of the people in the church to commit themselves and be involved. But yet we say we know we want to make it big. We want everyone to be involved. You know why? Because it's part of your growth. Some churches don't care about your growth. They just concentrate on full-time ministry people or just a handful of people that they can have less problem, you know. Or a smaller group of people that they can manage easy. None, too many people is just a crazy thing, you know. But no, in this church, it's not about us. It's not about, you know, not having problem. It's about giving the opportunity for you to give out to the Lord, to, to use your talent, your ministry. So, and, and having said that, in ministry involvement, it's one of the areas in the church that have the most problem. Because knowledge-wise, no, we don't have a problem because it's between you and your studying. Uh, personal is between you and God, changing your tr sanctification. But ministry involvement is talking about people and people in the church, and we have a lot of problems. <laughs> How many people left the church in ICC because of this? They disagree, they got upset, they got offended, blah, 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 they're gone. <laughs> but we're still doing it. Why? Because it's part of our spiritual growth. Without ministry involvement, you will never grow healthy. This tree balance up your growth. If you are only in one area, it only builds your head. Another area only builds your heart, but you're not giving out your heart. This is where you give out your heart, all right? So this is all a part of what we are projecting people to do. The reason I'm talking about this last part of it is because when we are doing this discipleship journey, we do want, again, I say it, we don't want it to be just academic books, learning, hate thing. We want these three areas in your life to grow. So when you're discipling someone, when someone is discipling you, make sure that not only you receive knowledge, but there is a transformation, there are transformation in your life, changing from glory to glory. And at the same time, when you're discipling someone, Talk to the person and get the person involved in the church. So if you're discipling someone, after le uh, uh, level one, you should say, hey, by the way, I see that on Sunday you don't get involved in any ministry at all. What is your gifting? What have God blessed you? 
If the person say to you, I have no gifting at all. The only thing I have is two feet and two hands. Oh, clean the toilet. <laughs> clean the house of the Lord. We need someone. Everybody can give something to the kingdom of God. Amen. Um, and that's what we want. And in the ministry involvement is where the discipline come in. The spiritual discipline come in. And this is just one of them. Uh, the, the spiritual discipline. Because it takes discipline for you to be committed to a ministry and serve God. And not allowing anything to take the place that God has put you in the body of Christ. All right? Praise God. Now, earlier when we talk about discipleship journey, we're talking about one of the areas that is missing in this program that we had before is mentorship. All right? And now we want the people to go beyond just the books. We want them to continue to grow in the Lord in discipleship, but at the same time, mentoring their disciple. All right? Like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. All right? This book is wonderful. It's been translated into so many languages now, and it's been used to disciple and bless many people. And through his word, many lives have been changed and transformed. But having said that, we want to go back to the basic because a lot of people are sticking to this book and not moving forward with mentorship. All right, the next um, last session I'm going to do before the noon is I'm going to share with you some basic principle about mentorship so that you, when you are discipling someone uh, with the book, you also have this thing in your mind about mentoring the person. All right? It's not just about spending half an hour or one hour with the person going through the lesson, but thinking about, okay, how can I mentor the person? How can he or she start following Christ in me and be changed by my life as I've been changed by Christ? All right? Let's take a five minutes break, coffee break, whatever break you want to take, and then we'll come back and finish the last part. All right, let's come together and then we're going to finish the last part. All right. The last part of our Christian Growth Seminar on Discipleship. Now, anybody else? Okay, now one thing I, f I forget to mention about the, uh, the journey that we talked about earlier on discipleship. Now, uh, if you're discipling someone and they have finished level three, you as a discipler, you need to recommend and ask them to then take the next level, all right? Now, when you uh, ask them to take the next level and um, on prayer, uh, and uh, the, the class on prayer, and then you check on them, all right? Now, since you have finished level three, you probably will not meet up with them to teach them anymore. But that doesn't mean you are no more their disciple. You continue this journey with them. That means you check on them. Are you taking your class? How are you doing? That means at least once a month, you should be meeting up with them just for fellowship, just to talk, just to pray, go out for coffee. That's part of the journey that you take with these people, all right? And, and so that you can continue your mentorship with the person, all right? Just in case you, I missed that point, I need to uh, tell you that, all right? So you will continue this journey with them until maybe one day they become a pastor. Or, or even that, you still meet with them. I mean, there are people that I have discipled in Ghana. They still contact me today. And especially when they need advice or prayer or something, they will always uh, uh, contact me because they still, I still have that relationship with them. Some of you may remember in the upper room, we have a guy from South Africa that came. His name is Cedric. Maybe you are not around. Uh, Brian remember him he, because every time he stand up to give a testimony, he cry. But anyway, um, he he was one of my disciples, and he is the C, He was the CEO of a company uh, in in um, Ghana, and then he was promoted and went to Nigeria as the CEO in, of a, another company, and he made a lot of money in Nigeria, over a million dollars uh, in the few years that he have, he was there. A commission that he make and all those things. So anyway, he left Nigeria, and now he doesn't know what to do with his life. 
And he thought, maybe I should go Bible school. Maybe I should start a business. You know, when you are in that stage, you know, you have money, you can start a business. You have money, you can go Bible school. You know, you, you don't know what you're doing. And you know what he did? He actually flew here to see me because I'm the disciple, right? So that we can pray about all those things. Of course, it's a, it was a vacation for him, but he told his wife that he has to see me to pray about this. But at the end, he went for vacation. Um, but it shows that the connection, the relationship we have, that he felt like he can just fly in here and stay with me and pray with me and talk with me about it, all right? So and even right now, I hardly talk to him now. I mean, he's in New Zealand now. Uh, but anytime, if he, if, he, if he need to talk to me or pray or anything, he know he can reach out anytime. And he's just one of, one of the person. I mean, there's so many others that I've discipled in Ghana that still have very strong connection with me, you know. Uh, some I've seen for years, every year when I go to Ghana, some I've not seen. Um, so this discipleship journey that you have will continue on with your disciple, all right? So when you finish level three, don't stop meeting with them. Try to meet up with them once a month at least. And encourage them to continue this journey on these classes that help them to grow. If they, if they get tired, they say, oh, I don't want to do the class. It's too difficult. It takes too much time. Blah, blah, blah. You encourage them. You say, look, I know how you feel. I've gone through this. And encourage them. So that's still part of your responsibility as a disciple. So don't just throw the ball away when you finish level three. You continue on this journey with them until they become better than you. All right, we're talking about mentorship. All right, this is something that we want you to implement in your discipleship with the people that God give you, all right? And not just based on the book, but mentorship, all right? Now, as, as I was looking through uh, mentorship, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, some are very complicated stuff, but, uh, you know, but I have chosen some of simple stuff that I want to share with you. Now, and one guy was writing about qualification of a mentor, all right? And um, I thought to myself, wow, what? I didn't know there's qualification. I thought all of us are called to mentor somebody, you know? But um, basically the person was explaining that, you know, the qualification that Paul put in First Timothy chapter 3 for elders, uh, it should be our standard also as mentor because that's where where we are going in mentoring someone, we has to be above reproach, you know. And so I was looking through it, uh, the qualification for elders or deacons or whatever, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7, and I, I felt like, wow, that is something that I need to share with you all, that this is the standard, this is where we want to be as a mentor, all right, because we, we have a standard as a mentor, in order to mentor someone, we have a standard, all right? Uh, just let me go quickly with you on this qualification uh, from based on 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. A mentor must be well established in the Christian faith, not a reason convert. That's for sure, all right? Uh, a mentor must be a person of good reputation and above reproach, all right? Uh, a mentor must be faithful to his or her spouse, all right? The marriage must be intact. If the marriage is broken, then you can't be a mentor. How can you mentoring someone when your life is in pieces, all right? A mentor, number four, a mentor must be level-headed and self-control, not controlled by bad habits or addiction, all right? So as a Christian, of course, we know we should not be controlled by anything except the Spirit of the Lord. So that means we should not have any addiction or bad habits. Because habits and addiction is almost the same. Um, so we should not have any addiction. That's why fasting is such a powerful thing. It breaks the bondage of addiction, all right? Fasting your food, fasting TV, fasting Facebook, fasting Internet, or whatever fasting that you need to do, all right? And number five, a mentor must be honest and genuine. Remember, remember this, people can see through you. You can't hide. You can put on a front. You can act. But at the end of the day, people will see through you. Always remember this. People are not stupid. You may think they're stupid, but they're not. And they can see through you. After a while, they're like, ah, this person. I can't trust him. He's not real. You know, people can see. But be real. 
All right? If you have a problem in your life that God is doing something, maybe an anger issue, just say, look, I have an anger issue. You know, God is working in me, you know. It's been, you know, three years now God is working. And, and you can pray for me. Uh, and be real. Be honest. But yet, at the same time, you're not negative. Some people can be real and become so negative. That's not real. That's just being neg- be negative, all right? We don't want that also. A mentor must love what is good, upright, and holy. A mentor must be biblically literate. That means uh, have biblical knowledge. You, you can't disciple someone, mentor someone if you don't know the Bible. You need to know the Bible. So if you don't know the Bible, then you need to learn to study, read the Bible, all right? A mentor must be able to share and teach. All right, and when we talk about teaching, it's not just about a school teacher teaching cl- classroom type of thing. All right, I have seen teachers that is lousy. All right, he, but he's a teacher, but he's a lousy teacher. But I've seen people that are not in classroom, but a fantastic teacher, one to one especially. All right, able to impart, able to share, able to 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 lead you to a place of holiness, a place of Christ. I mean, some of these people are great. I have a Bible school teacher that I was so looking forward to him teaching in my class because he's the most well-known Assembly of God theologian, and he's coming. And, and with the first class that he's, he came to taught us, he can quote the Bible without reading the Bible. I mean, this guy knows the Bible. I mean, he can just say the verses out without reading it. I'm like, whoa. But I'm telling you, at the end of this course, he was the worst teacher I ever have. <laughs> He's the most boring teacher. But the information he has is great. But he's the... Right? Right? So he was not... He was imparting... I mean, his material was great. uh, You know, and I read his book. He's fantastic. But as a person, as a teacher, he's not. So when we say teaching, that means it's not just because you are a classroom teacher, you're great in presentation, but rather... You are able, individually with the person that you are responsible to, you are able to guide the person to truth. Yes. All right? And, and everybody is different. Now, I can be a, a good teacher to a, a person that I flow with. Wow, I can talk. We flow together, and I'm imparting, I'm helping the person. Another person, oh, my goodness, <laughs> so difficult. And the person probably thought I'm a lousy teacher. I'm, I, was, I, I thought the same thing with the other person. So everybody is different. That's right. So I have to change my method. I have to change my way of doing and talking. And, 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 you know, and sometimes, to be honest, I fail with some people. Not because of me. It's just I'm not able to connect with the person. You know? So we have then to find a way to connect. But we must be able somehow to find a way to connect, to impart the truth to the person, all right? Uh, A mentor must be hospitable, ready to welcome people in the church. Okay, this is something I need to stop and talk about in this church, is this. Please, and I shared this on the pulpit before, uh, let's try to build relationship by taking each other out. You know, I, you know, when I was a young Christian, one of the things that I love going to church on Sunday is after church. We go, all go out to eat in a restaurant. We spend time. Of course, I was single at the time. <laughs> well, I love that. And after church, everybody said, hey, we're going to the restaurant. Who will want to come? Yeah, me, me. And then we all, a group of us, sometimes 20 people, will go and fill up the, 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 well, in Singapore, we call it the hawker center. We'll fill up the, and we'll be talking, and people are looking at us. Who is this group of people talking so loud, you know? But we don't care. We're talking. We're fellowshipping. And then at the end, some of us, smaller group, will go coffee somewhere else. We're spending the whole day together. Before I got married, of course, you know? Uh, then I have kids, and everything changed, you know? But, we want to encourage those kind of things in our church. We don't want you to like, you know, on Sunday come, okay, see you guys. It's like you're lost. You don't know where to go. No. Invite someone for lunch. Invite someone to your house for dinner or something. Connect and build life together. And that's what we want to promote. And as a leader, uh, and if you're especially mentoring someone, this is one way you can mentor someone. Bring them to your house, you know. And don't be afraid to be open to the person. A mentor must have a gentle, gracious spirit, not given to violence, which I don't think is a problem. Uh, a mentor must not be a lover of money. 
uh, of material possession, all right? Uh, a mentor must be, uh, first of all, a mentoring your household, all right? It means if you have a household, your wife, your children, you'll be able, first of all, to mentor them. That means to take care of your household. If you can't take care of your household, how they, then you can take care of others, all right? If you can't take care of your own children, you can't discipline your own children, then how can you discipline other people? But, but the thing is, I've seen people, they are mess in their house. But they're going around to the church, you should not do that, that's wrong. But they come back home, they are kids, it's like the devil. And they don't say anything. That's wrong because people see through it next time. Ah, are you telling me? But tell your children, <laughs> you know, or tell your husband, you know. <laughs> I mean, come on, you know. So we have to be careful on that because we will lose respect and trust. And, 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 and so we have to be careful that we are able to manage, not to the, I'm not perfect. No one is perfect. But at least people can see that we are trying to manage our household properly, all right? All right, let me quickly go to the characteristic of a good, uh, of a mentor is this. Um, number one is you are a good listener, all right? That means talk less, listen more. To mentor someone, you have to listen to them. That means you have to make them talk. You have to ask questions, all right? It may be difficult if you are a talker like me. Uh, you tend to want to talk more. Uh, so Connie always said, Psh, ask question. You know? uh, then, I, I, then I create question that I can ask the person to make the person talk. All right? So this is how mentorship is. It's about that person, not about you. Sometimes, you know, as, as an older person in the Lord, we tend to say, oh, I have so much to share. That's the first thing that comes to you. you. When you sit down with your mentor, I have all this experience and all this knowledge. I want to just give it. No, that's the wrong thing to do. The first thing you have to do is listen. All right? Ask questions about the person. Get to know the person. All right? And, 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 and take time to show that you care about the person. All right? You know, people want to listen to you only after you, they feel that you care for them. All right. If they don't sense that you care for them, everything you say is just blah, 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 coming out from your mouth. They're not listening at all. And after a while, they even stop meeting with you because it's like, you don't really care. You only care about sharing your stuff, and which is not good. All right. So take personal interest in the person. All right. And like I said earlier, you know, if the person has problem, needs, that's the best opportunity is to show your cares, your love. I mean, if you take the person out for coffee or dinner or something, it's great. It shows that you care. But more than that is when they have a need, when they are sick, when they have financial problem, when they have depression, when they are sad, or something bad happened to them. That's the time you run in and then that moment you take that opportunity, it's like a golden egg, you grab it. And you, they will never forget you. They will love you forever for that. Because you care. You love, all right? So as a pastor, one of the things we love to do as pastors, and I share with the leaders too, is look for that opportunity. It doesn't happen every day, every month, but it will happen one day. And then you take that opportunity to show that care. Visit them in a the hospital, you know, when their wife gave birth, you know, or when... They, they have lost their job or something. There are moments in life that they need someone and you must be there. You have to drop everything. You know, if you say, I have vacation, cancel your vacation if you need to. Vacation will come every year, every time. But that moment only comes once in a blue moon. And you grab it if you have to. And don't be afraid. Hey, the year of courage. Don't be afraid to cancel vacation. Don't be, uh, no, Brian, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I'm talking, Brian's like, ah, no, I'm not talking about you. Oh, thank God Christine Lagasca is down here. <laughs> and she will kill me. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm talking about, you know, there are moments in life. And, and, and it's, let me tell you, I'll, I'll tell you this. There are moments in life that we treasure. We, uh, you know, that is more important than anything else. And even if you have to lose your air tickets or lo lose your booking or whatever, there are moments in life 
your wife, your husband, or people in the church, that you can never get it back. And you need to be wise on that. And God will bless you for that. There are a lot of times, I have to cancel a lot of stuff until my kids get upset with me. I thought we were going to the beach. Uh, sorry, we are not going today. <laughs> because I have something uh, that people need me. Death for life. Something that is much more important than going to the beach. And I know my kids hate me for that because I cancel. But I apologize for that. But hey, there are moments that we have to grab. It show your love and concern. And thirdly, uh, thirdly or fourthly, um, uh, respect. Treat people with respect. That is the most important thing. And that is lacking in our society today. Respect. All right? And that's what we're, the, the people in the world are looking for, all right? It doesn't matter you agree or disagree, whether you like it or you don't like it. You always show proper respect, godly respect to each other. There are people that you feel like, oh, I don't want to even see the person. They're just so angry. You have a right to be angry. You have a right to, to disagree. But at the end of the day, as a Christian, we have to show the proper respect. Now, I was taught to respect older people when I was growing up. I mean, the Chinese culture that come from the teaching of Confucian uh, taught that, respect the oldest, all right? And it's nothing wrong with that, that, that teaching, you know, uh, to show respect. But, um, so I have no problem showing respect to older people, and I always take time to show that. All my life, I always make a point to do that. That's why, that's how I want my my in-laws. That's why they say I'm the best in-laws. <laughs> uh, my father-in-law before he died, you are the best in-laws that I have. I said, yay! <laughs> but uh, but. Respect is not just for older people. It's supposed to be one another. Whether they are younger than us or immature or older people, we, we are called to respect. And, and that respect that you have for one another will show it off. And it will translate into your disciple. And they will see it. And they will remember that. And that will change their way of respecting too. All right? And, and there are many ways we can show respect, and you probably know about it, so I'm not going to uh, wa waste time on that. Um, yeah. And, you know, you're taught when you are growing up, uh, one of the respect I was taught growing up is that when you see someone, you greet somebody. You know, good morning. Hi, how are you? That's just an easy way to show respect. You don't even have to sacrifice anything to that. And that's, but to, you know, to us, it's like, why? Why not? <laughs> you know, you know, that's to other people, it means a lot to them. You know, you know, if they don't receive it, it means a lot to them. All right. Um, uh, the next point is that a um, uh, characteristic of a mentor is someone that takes responsibility. A responsibility for themselves, responsibility for others. All right. Um, I know it's easy to take responsibility for yourself. But sometimes for others, you may not want to because it's like, none of my business. You know? and, but if God has given a person to you, to disciple, to mentor, that it becomes your responsibility. You know? So the growth, the spiritual growth of the person is actually in, in your hand. You, God wants to use you. God's method is a person, is people. And so God chosen you to be a blessing, to, to, to be a channel of blessing and growth for that person. And we need to take that responsibility seriously or God will hold us accountable for that, all right? That's why what we say to the person, how we say to the person, we take that seriously, all right? There are things that sometimes you want to say, it, but you say, no, that's not right. You don't say it. You know why? Because for the growth of the person, you know? I mean, sometimes... You know, people hurt me or betray me or, you know, whatever. I want to share it out. I want the world to know I'm going through this pain. It's easy. It's a natural feeling. Then you come to church on Sunday morning, you start looking. Who can I share this pain in me? And if somebody say, poor you, tell me everything. Ah, you pull up everything. 
right? Now, if you are mentoring someone, do not do that. All right? Do not do that. All right? Do not do that. If you have pain, you have to go to someone that is older in the Lord. Someone that understands and know how to deal with it. Someone that will not give into your flesh or your self pityness but someone will, will have empathy, but yet correct you and help you to grow. But not to your mentee. <laughs> okay, now, come here. Before we start meeting and sharing this lesson, let me tell you something happened to me. And you pull out and the guy like, wow, I don't want to go back to that church anymore. <laughs> it's like, you know, that's not the way we do it. So we take things seriously, you know. Uh, you know, what we share, what we not share, how we do things, we take it seriously, all right? And uh, lastly, um, I'm going to skip some of the point here. Lastly is, everybody do not like to be judged. So in your relationship, in your mentorship, try not to be, uh, try not to be uh, judgmental, all right? The, uh, people want to feel safe with you. When they come, then they pull up their heart to you. When they share things to you, nobody like to be judged. You know, no one like to be feel like after they share their mistake, their sin, or their shortcoming, and then they look at you and your eyes like, mm -hmm, bad, bad person. <laughs> Don't like, nobody like that. It, they, they were close, you know, and and so. The, the key is this. People like to feel that they can trust you. You know, and, and talking about that, uh, if they can't trust you, you're finished. You cannot. You can just change to somebody else. If, if your disciple cannot trust you, you are not able to mentor the person, close shop. Or go and apologize and say, I'm so sorry. I know you don't trust me because of this. I can sense it. Or go to the person and say, look, I feel like there is a trust issue between you and me. And we can't continue this relationship if there's no trust. So can you share with me? Maybe there's something I did that offended you. Or let's talk about it and get it right. Or else you should just say sorry. And there are people that come to me in this church and they don't respect me anymore or they don't trust me as their leader. I say, you need to find another church because you can't be in this church if you don't trust your pastor. It doesn't work. I say, you need to go and find a pastor that you can trust, you know, or take a break and evaluate yourself or something. But trust is important, you know, it's important because if people don't trust you, they will not open up to you and you're not able to influence them. You got to have trust, all right? And um, people um, want to see that you are giving your life to them. All right? You're sacrificing. You are, you, are, you are willing to do anything to help them to grow. That sense, that feeling of cares, love, that feeling that, of trust, the feeling that someone loves you more than you love yourself, that feeling helps you to mentor that person. And that's how you create mentorship, the environment, the place that you can then, you know, talk to them about it. Mentorship, I think, is one of the hardest thing because you're dealing with people. When you're dealing with people, it's always difficult. But let me tell you, at the end of the day, it's worth it. It's worth it. I, I can tell you, in terms of success in mentoring people, I don't have 100% success. I have a lot of people that I mentor that I thought, wow, this person, I'm doing a great job, and boom. And then something happened, and then boom, we are no more together. Or, or something happened that the person had gone away or something, you know. So, but that doesn't stop us. That should not stop us. Uh, we learn, we grow, we're still human beings, we make mistakes, we apologize, we grow, we continue on this journey. And, and it's a long journey, but it's a journey that God has called us to take. And, and we can do it because God has called us. He will never call us to do something that he thinks that we cannot do it. He's not going to play a game with us like, I'm going to call you to mentor this person. And I know you cannot do it. 
No, he's not going to do that. He called you because he believed in you that you can do it. And if you give all to him, he will use you. Amen. All right, we're going to stop right now. Uh, any question at all? Anybody have any contribution in regards to this lesson that we have? Yeah, um, Tom. Uh, just, uh, I know this is probably in your mind already, but uh, just praying for your men mentee. Um, so that sort of helps sensitize you to their needs and God's doing supernatural work in their life through the intercessory prayer. So I just thought I'd add that to the list. Yeah, yeah praying for your, your mentee is, I think, is the key to see transformation because you recognize it's not by might or by power, but by the Holy Spirit, right? Anybody else have any uh, contribution or question? Yes, uh, uh, Brian. So one thing that God has uh, worked in my heart is to really, uh, before I even approach that person, what is my motive? Uh, what, what's in my heart? What is the reason why I want to mentor the person? Is it really... Uh, uh, motivated by the actual love of God or is just for uh, personal gains and and from a personal experience there's a uh, one student that that I uh, I I thought that it would be hard to difficult with to deal with and and I asked God uh, well just gotta love the person and I think that was so powerful for me that revelation that Really, what's my motive in all these things? Do I truly love the person, or do I just use it for uh, whatever it is to uh, for self life? Or yeah. Hey Amen. That's good, Brian. And also, that reminds me uh, with Brian that you know we can sort of check our own schedule. Um, like, do we have capacity to sort of disciple somebody at this particular time if we're having a lot of personal struggles or overwhelmed in life? Maybe it's not the right time. And then in the same vein, really praying for discernment. Is this the person I should take on for whatever reason? Um, maybe there's somebody else that would be the better fit, and God might reveal that person. So kind of praying for discernment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two points about this thing that, br uh, uh, that Tom brought it up. Um, the first thing, if, if you are discipling and mentoring someone and you have issues that is beyond your ability to solve or help the person, you know you don't have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. You can come to the leadership, uh, to the pastors, to your leaders, and say, hey, I'm stuck with this guy. I don't know what to, how, what to do or how to do. Um, and, and we can help you. We can advise you or we can sit down with the person and help the person pray deliverance for the person. You know, sometimes if your disciple come to you and say, look, I have this demonic thing, you know, you're like, whoa, it's too much for me. You know, I don't know what to do about this. But, hey, there are people in the church can help you. So you're not alone. You can network with other people in the church in, in your journey in helping your disciple. You know, there are areas that you have no idea what to do. And then talking about... Um, uh, if you are with someone and, and you're discipling with someone after th maybe three months or more, and you realize, oh, this guy and me are not clicking at all. It's like <laughs> heaven and earth kind of thing. You know, it's like you are, you are thinking this way, the person thinking that way, and you try to teach, but it's not getting through because, the, you know, some people are just different. Don't be afraid to say, hey, um, I think this is not working because uh, I find that maybe someone else can flow better with you and, and maybe can minister to you better. Is it okay if I find somebody else to help you and disciple you or somebody, you know? Uh, don't be embarrassed to do that. We have seen it happen in this church. Uh, people start off thinking, hey, uh, can I disciple you? Yeah, yeah, why not? And then after a few months, they're like, ooh, wow, 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 it's not working out, you know? Um, and sometimes people don't want to say it, they don't want to hurt your feeling, but both of you like look at each other every time, it's like, oh, you're not flowing. Just say, hey, you know, I, you know, sometimes you can make excuses like, you know, I'm not available now, but can I find someone that can help you? You know, something like that, you know, don't be afraid. The key is to find someone that you actually can do something real, you know. It's not just 
keep dragging on, and then you like at the end of the day, I wish I didn't take it. You know, uh, Pastor Rick, yeah. I just appreciate so much of what you said this morning, but when Brian mentioned your motive in, in making a mentor or discipling someone, um, I think it's been a challenge for me, and I've really been confronted by where we're at right now with what you're teaching and where, where we want to go with making disciples. And, you know, it's not just about getting three lessons done and you're done, but going on from there and you know, I've had people ask me to mentor them, and I've been reluctant to do it because a lot of it has been because of my own confidence or where I think I am, because a lot of the people that I have discipled, I feel like in many ways are further along than I am. And I think it's a, it's a, again, going back to the motive, is it because I want to look good? Is it because I want to try and impress someone? Or is it because I love them? And I just want to be there for them. And, you know, and I, don't, I don't have all the answers. There's no way that I have all the answers, but I can pray. And I can ask God. And I can, and I can share what the Holy Spirit shows me. But I think that one of the things for me, which is a victory for us, is the, to see that I, I don't have to deal with rejection. I don't have to worry about whether or not they're going to accept me. Um, I'm just doing it because I love them. And because the love of God is flowing through me and reaching out to them. And uh, I read something just this morning that if, if God's not so concerned about all that you do, if you're not doing it in love. And then he led me to Matthew 7, 7, 22, where it says, you come to me and you say all these things that you've done, but depart from me because I don't even know you. Because if we're not doing it in love, we don't know God because he is love. And if, we're, if our motive isn't because of love, then it's all just performance. And it's not going to produce anything. And you can come and say, God, look at all these people that I discipled. And he'll say, but you didn't do it for the right reason. You did it to try and build your own ministry or whatever. If it's not in love, then it's not worth anything. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody Stages was really good, and okay. I just. Uh, Michael, can you put back the stage uh, stages? Oh, you mean the slide? You wanted yes. you want me to send the slide to you? Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Um, on the characteristic of different stages. Okay, no problem. I can. I if anybody need anything from what I'm teaching, I can always send it to you. Um, I did. I didn't give you any paper because. Um, I have so many things that I thought, okay, I don't know which one I want to cover in this. Um, but I'm, I, was, I can email you that uh, slide. Yeah, no problem. All right, anybody else? Um, question or contribution? Something that you want to share or question you want to ask? Yes, I think. I think the, the key in when you become a disciple maker, because I think that's our goal, right? It's not just to be a disciple, but to become a disciple maker is to continue to keep in that humble position of where we're doing this, like what Pastor Rick said, for the love of the people. And that will protect us against trying to be judgmental, like he said, or be controlling. Because sometimes I notice the word discipling in America has, uh, in the 80s and 90s, took a very negative taint to it because it was part of the shepherding movement where, you know, it's like if your leader didn't allow you to do something, you couldn't even sneeze, you know. But that's not what this is about. And I always share with my disciples that I'm not God, I'm not Jesus, and I'm not the Holy Spirit. So in a sense, that is the key to discipling, is to get them not to be dependent on us, but to be dependent on Jesus. And we're just kind of the facilitator there through their ongoing journey. And sometimes it's difficult because we can blur the line. We're like, oh, why didn't they call me to get advice about that? Hey, but if they're asking the Holy Spirit, isn't that so much better? So, yeah, that's a, something good to keep in mind. Praise God. Anybody else?
People from the back? So far, we have people from the front. How about people from the back? Pastor Colin, you have anything you want to share? No? Praise God. Well, we'll we finish on time, in a sense. Um, praise God. Okay, Leo. Wow. Praise God. Somebody from the back. <laughs> um, actually, uh, I have a completely different thing to come up here for. But um, since everybody's here, and um, I really appreciate what Pastor was sharing about, and uh, Rick, what you talk about love. And uh, I've been having sleep well this whole week, and um, uh, it's about, like, my family and stuff like this. Um, there's so many going on in my family. But uh, hearing the... <clears throat> Sorry. Hearing the teaching this morning is, is about this high point and how God loved people. And, and I really want us to stand together and pray for my family because I grew up in a Christian family and I thought they knew better than but like what you said, you know, we can grow in, in the church for so many years, but if we're not experiencing the love of God. So I want us to pray for my whole family. Praise God. Hallelujah. Stretch your hand towards Leo. Let's pray for Leo right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Father, right now, Lord, I just want to thank you for Leo. I thank you for his life. I thank you, God, that your hand is upon him. And, Father, we want to lift up his family to you right now in the name of Jesus. And, Father, whatever that is going on right now in his family, in regards to their relationship with you. Father, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you have mercy upon them, that you will draw them back to you, that you call them by name and, and bring them back to the saving grace, to the relationship that they once experienced. And I pray for Leo, God, that you give him strength and peace in Jesus' name right now. Let the peace of God guard his heart. Oh, let the joy of the Lord be his strength today in Jesus' name. And Father, as we trust you, as we pray for his family back home, oh God, Lord, let your hand be upon them, oh God, that you will touch them, that you will provide for them, that Lord, whatever that's going on, God, that you will somehow use that to minister, to reach out to them, oh God. Father, I want to thank you right now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. All right. Anybody else uh, before we close? Yeah, Tony? I just wanted to thank the Lord that this is a answer to prayer, this whole program. Because... Um, I know that uh, we went through discipleship with Pastor Colleen and Pastor Rick, and we had that same question at the end of it is, what now? <laughs> like, we're fired up. We're like, we're ready to take down, take down the world for the kingdom. And while there was, it was nice to have a short break afterwards, after all that hard work, um, we were kind of like in a lull, like, what's next? We're like, we want to, we, we need to, we weren't sure what to do next. And for us, it was life group. It was the only logical step we could think of becoming life group leaders. And so um, this is really exciting. Um, so it's just a blessing and an answer to much prayer. Thank you. All right. And we are projecting that these um, classes that we have, especially the first part of it, um, uh, will be ready by maybe in May. We announced that. And once the classes, especially the first class on prayer, when it's ready, we will put it on video on, on, on um, the website when Brian come back. And uh, then we announce it in May. And then you guys that finish level three, you can then uh, start taking the, those classes. And the nice thing is you can do it in your home and, you, and your, 
less your time, and you can uh, the notes, the lesson will be there for you to download into your computer, uh, Word document if you can, and then you can, um, you know, use it whatever way you like it. But it helps you to have something that you can start doing, like a personal projects class that you can take and you can study. And 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 one thing about here is that um, we'll try our best to give you as much meat that we can uh, without bringing you too deep that you're like, whoa, this is not me, man, this is too much, you know. But yeah, it will give you uh, enough appetite and meat for you to continue on this journey, all right? Um, so, and we have good teachers, so I'm looking forward to that. Some of the classes, I've talked to Pastor Rick and Colleen and, and also Tom uh, to, to do, and then later I'll be talking to other people in this church to do some of the other classes. Amen. All right. You have anything, Sarah? All right. If nobody else have, uh, Emma, you have a question, a contribution. So yeah, there was some point that uh, Pastor sit down. Uh, there was some point that uh, I try to remember who mentioned that you know about. You know, like if you're mentoring somebody, like being like a facilitator, uh, not like letting them put their hope in you if you're mentoring them. And I see that a lot, like in Uganda, you know. So most of the people, when they go to the pastor, so they go when they are so vulnerable, you know, they're asking, looking for like some help. And most of the time, it ended up those people. They put all of their hope, you know, on someone who's mentoring them instead of the men, the people that they're mentoring them, like directing them that, you know, I'm just, I'm just me. It is Jesus who is going to help you. And I see that a lot in Uganda. And, and even, like, for example, uh, when I, you know, get time to like, talk with my family, you know, we help them sometime. And a lot of time I see the same thing that um, they try to look to me or to us, instead of them looking that it's God who is helping you, who is doing this to you. And most of the time I tell them, you know, it is not actually us who is helping you, it is God who is using us to help you. And at the same point, as we're mentoring too, we, we direct them to Christ. And sometimes, you know, God will tell them something that maybe will not through you. So that's what I just... Man, you know, uh, one thing about making disciple and mentoring someone, uh, the tendency is sometimes because you spend so much time helping them to grow in the Lord, they um, will depend on you a lot of time. So the trick is, uh, rather the, the thing that you have to do is not allowing them to depend. So anytime they depend on you, you move them back to Jesus. You try to say, okay, please, you know. Uh, it's difficult because you want to be a hero, and so don't try to be a hero. Um, don't try to be the savior. You're not. Um, but the king is that to say, hey, um, Jesus loves you. Jesus want to help you. You know, I'm here because Jesus asked me to do it. You know, that way then you can help them to bring them to Jesus. All right, let's stand, and then we're going to close in prayer exactly 12 o'clock. Um, then we can go back and rest for today. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just want to thank you for each and every one that is here, and thank you for those that are watching through, live, uh, through the Zoom. Father, we just want to thank you that we can go now and make disciples of all nations. We thank you, God, for your anointing, the anointing of your Spirit upon this church, upon each and every one. And Father, as we go forth, God, this year to make disciples, as you have called us, Lord, equip us, strengthen us, and Father, help us. Help us, oh God, to make time, to take time, to, to, to give to people all around us, oh God. Father, I thank you for all that you have done in us. I thank you for ICC, for the people that you brought to this church. And Father, we ask for your continued blessing today. Give us a wonderful day today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone say, Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much for coming. May the Lord bless you. Amen.